So this is the last day of our class. Okay, yesterday we finished up to the attainment of Magga or Path. So after the attainment of Magga or Path, there follow two or three moments of fruition moments and then the thought process subsides into bhavanga and then what follows are called the reviewing thought processes so everybody who has reached the enlightenment reviews the path the fruit that means fruition consciousness and nibbana invariably and regarding the defilements destroyed and defilements remaining he may or may not review now i want you to understand the moment of enlightenment with reference to the chart that was distributed long ago during the time we studied the fourth chapter but fortunately there is a transparency and so i want you to look at the transparency on the screen so this is the thought process it is called path thought process actually it contains path and also fruition so when a person is about to gain enlightenment this thought process occurs in his mind so first we have a bhavanga and then vibrating bhavanga and a rest bhavanga as usual but there is no past bhavanga because it is mind or thought process and not five sense or thought process and then mano dwara vajana or mind door adverting so at that moment the active moments of consciousness begin so first the mind turns to the object so there is mano dwara vajana or mind door adverting and then follow preparation excess and conforming in pali they are called parikama upachara and anuloma so these three moments of consciousness arise and after the conformity or anuloma comes gotrabhu ji gotrabhu that is change of lineage so change of lineage happens at that moment and following that magga or path consciousness follows and then here two fruition moments follow and after the second fruition moment the flow of consciousness subsides into bhavanga again so this is the enlightenment thought process we can call it now in this thought process first look at the objects the first three takes the kama or kama nimitta or gati nimitta as object as usual so bhavanga chitta so bhavanga consciousness always takes one of these three kama or sign of kama or sign of destination and then mind or adverting and others arise and they take what are called miscellaneous formations that means the object of vipassana meditation so when you practice vipassana meditation you take the mind as object or matter as object and mind and matter are called here miscellaneous formations different kinds of formations since mind and matter are conditioned by some other uh, causes they are called formations so they take miscellaneous formations as object so three moments 
following the Mindo adverting take the miscellaneous formations as object. Actually, they are the vipassana consciousness. Since they are vipassana consciousness, they take miscellaneous formations as object. And then Gautrabhu or change of lineage arises. But it takes Nibbana as object. Now Upachara, Anuloma and Gautrabhu are actually wholesome sense sphere consciousnesses. Kama Vajra Kusala Chaitas. So the four moments of Kama Vajra Kusala Chaitas arise uh, before uh, the arising of Maga or the path. Among these four, the first three take miscellaneous formations as object and G Gotrabhu takes Nibbana as object. And after it, Maga or path arises. And Maga takes Nibbana as object and the following fruition movements also take Nibbana as object. So in this thought process, there is the difference of objects for uh, different thought moments. In other types of thought processes, the object of all the types of consciousness in one given thought process must be the same. But here, the objects are different. Some take miscellaneous formations as object, and the others Nibbana as object. Now Gudrabhu is called change of lineage. That means at that moment a person is changed into a noble person. Actually he will change as a noble person when he reaches the Magga moment. So it is a preparation for change actually. So from this moment on, that means beginning with Magga moment, he is called an Ariya or a noble person. So he changes from an ordinary or Puttujana to an Ariya or a noble person and so it is called change of lineage. Actually you have met change of lineage regarding the jhana thought processes also. But their change is from Kama Vajra to Rupa Vajra. But here change is from Puttu Jana to Ariya or waddling to noble persons. Although Godrabhu takes Nibbana as object, it cannot do the function of eradicating mental defilements. It just takes Nibbana as object, it just sees Nibbana, but it cannot eradicate mental defilements. Eradication of mental defilement occurs only at the moment of path or pala. At the moment of path, destruction of defilements or eradication of defilements is achieved. Now you will Remember that consciousness is always accompanied by mental factors. So along with path consciousness, Magga there, 36 mental factors arise. And among the 36, there are 8 that are called 8 factors of path. Among the 8 factors of path, there is Panya or right understanding. Actually it is that Panya that accomplishes the destruction of defilements. So destruction of defilements or eradication of defilements takes place at the moment of path or Maga. And following Maga there are two in this process there are two moments of fruition or Pala consciousness. And the function of these two is further tranquilization of defilements. 
defilements are destroyed at the moment of path or maga but at the moments of fruition they are further tranquilized that means suppose a person puts out a fire that putting out the fire is uh, like path moment destruction of mental defilements and then after that he would pour uh, water on the fire already extinguished so that it cannot burn again so in the same way so that defilements cannot come up again the phala moments further tranquilize the defilements so the actual eradication of mental defilements occurs at the moment of path and during the phala moments they are further tranquilized uh, they are further subdued so this is the path thought process or enlightenment thought process so according to the fixed law of consciousness the moments of consciousness shown here must follow one after another there can be no skipping of any one of them and so without the three moments parikama upachara and anuloma there can be no kotrabu g and when there is no kotrabu there can be no path maga and when there is no maga there can be no phalas so that means enlightenment can occur only through the practice of vipassana meditation because parikama upachara and anuloma these three are the vipassana consciousnesses strictly speaking kotrabu is not vipassana because vipassana must take miscellaneous formations as object but it does not take miscellaneous formations but nibbana as object so it is not vipassana but since it comes after the flow of vipassana it is included in vipassana but strictly it is not vipassana so only the parikama upachara and anuloma are vipassana so this is how we must understand the enlightenment we often talk about enlightenment but sometimes we may not know what enlightenment is so it is important that when we talk about enlightenment we define it so that the other person understands what we mean enlightenment may mean different things to different people people of different religions so if you ask a christian you will get one answer and if you ask a hindu you may get another answer so it is important that when we talk about enlightenment we must define it and enlightenment consists in the arising of path consciousness and mental factors along with it and eradication of mental defilements and taking nibbana as object so these four things constitute what we call enlightenment so at the moment of enlightenment path consciousness arises and along with path consciousness the seekers mental factors arise so among the mental factors there are eight factors of path and then there must be the eradication of mental defilements and the path consciousness must take nibbana as object so only when it can take nibbana can maga consciousness or path consciousness arise so nibbana serves as an object object condition for the path consciousness 
So a yogi must go through uh, different stages of vipassana one by one. He must begin with defining mind and matter and then discerning the conditions and then seeing the three characteristics and then discernment of rise and fall and so on. Actually these stages are logical sequence in the practice. Now you see the three characteristics and then you become disenchanted with them and then you want to throw them away or you want to get rid of them and then you make another effort and then as a result you reach enlightenment. This is explained in Visuddhimagga with a very powerful simile. It is a simile of a person catching a fish. You may have heard of this a simile. So I will read it to you. Okay. Here is a simile. A man thought to catch a fish. So he took a fishing net and cast it in the water. A net here means not the net fishermen use. It is a basket, basket like net. So he put it in the water. He put it and then when he thought that he had caught a fish, he put his hand into the mouth of the basket under the water and seized a snake by the neck. He was glad thinking I have caught a fish. In the belief that he had caught a big fish, he lifted it up to see. When he saw the three marks, like poison marks on the neck of the snake, the three lines, he perceived that it was a snake and he was terrified. He saw danger, felt dispassion or revulsion for what he had seized and desired to be delivered from it. Contriving a means to deliverance, he unwrapped the coils from his hand, starting from the tip of its tail. Then he raised his arm, and when he had weakened the snake by swinging it two or three times around his head, he flung it away, crying, Go, foul snake! Then quickly scrambling up onto dry land, he stood looking back whence he had come thinking, goodness, I have been delivered from the jaws of a huge snake. So this is a simile given in Visodhi Magga. Now the time when the meditator was glad at the outset to have acquired a person is like the time when the man was glad to have seized the snake by the neck. That means, now we are born as human beings and we have this body. And we are pleased with this body, we, we are attached to this body, we are happy that we have this body. So it is like the man who thought that he has caught a fish. The meditator seeing the three characteristics and the formations after affecting resolution of the compact into elements is like the man seeing the three marks on pulling the snake's head out of the mouth of the net. So a meditator during the stage of comprehending the mind and matter, he sees the three characteristics. So that is like the man seeing the three marks of the snake. So when he sees the three marks, he knows it, the snake is poisonous and it could bite him and it could kill him. So it is like the yogi seeing the three characteristics. The meditator's knowledge of appearance of terror is like the time when he was frightened. So after seeing the three marks, he became frightened. He knew that it was a poisonous snake and now he was afraid. So it is like the meditator's knowledge of appearance as terror. That means seeing formations as fearful. Knowledge of contemplation of danger is like the man's thereupon seeing the danger. So after seeing the snake as poisonous, he sees danger in the snake. In the same way, after seeing the three characteristics, he sees danger or he sees faultiness in uh, mind and matter, or his body. Knowledge of contemplation of dispassion is like the man's dispassion 
or revulsion for what he has seized. Now he doesn't want it. He wants to turn away from it. The man's dispassion for the conditioned phenomena or for mind and matter. That means he loses interest now. And he no longer wants to keep it in his hand since he knows that it is a snake and there is danger. So in the same way, when a yogi sees the three characteristics and understands that the mind and matter are fearful and faulty, he loses interest in being attached to the mind and matter. Knowledge of desire for deliverance is like the man's deliverance from the snake. So now he wants to get rid of mind and matter because they are faulty, they are dangerous and they are like a poisonous snake. The attribution of the three characteristics to formations by knowledge, contemplation or reflection is like the man's contriving a means deliverance. That means after he has the desire to get rid of or to give up the mind and matter he further contemplates on the three characteristics. That is like the man taking the snake and swinging the snake over his head to make it weaker. Just as the man weakened a snake by swinging it, keeping it away and rendering it incapable of biting and was thus quite delivered, so too this meditator weakens formations by swinging them with the attribution of the three characteristics. That means he again tries to see the mind and matter as impermanent suffering and non-soul so that he does not uh, go to taking them as permanent and so on again. So this is the simile given in Visodhimaga. So you can find this simile on page 761 of this book or by chapter it is chapter 21 paragraph 49 and 50 and you should also read the paragraph 93 as a continuation of this explanation of the simile so like this fisherman we are first pleased with our bodies we are first pleased with what we encounter, what we have, what we experience. But from the moment we see the three characteristics, we are not so happy because we now know that it is disintegrating or dissolving every moment and so there is danger, it is fearful and it is dangerous or faulty and so on. So we want to get rid of it and so we put forth effort again to thoroughly understand mind and matter as impermanent and so on and then later uh, when our meditation becomes mature then we will get into the stage of enlightenment and now the manual tells us about the three doors to emancipation and the emancipation itself now these are not so important for the practice. Whether we know um, through uh, which door emancipation comes, what is important is for the emancipation to come. So if you are curious about which door emancipation comes, then you need to understand this. So the contemplation of non-self, which discusses the clinging to a self, becomes a door to emancipation termed contemplation of the void. Emancipation simply means maga or enlightenment moment. The contemplation of impermanence which discards the sign of perversion becomes the door to emancipation termed contemplation of the signless. The contemplation of suffering which discards desire through craving becomes the door to emancipation termed contemplation of desireless. So there are three Contemplation, contemplation of non-self, anatta, contemplation of impermanence, anicca, and contemplation of suffering, dukkha. So when insight reaches its culmination, it settles upon one of the three contemplations. 
the yogi actually made all three contemplations because he sees the impermanence of uh, the conditioned phenomena, he sees the suffering nature, and he sees the uh, non-self nature of the conditioned phenomena. But when insight reaches its culmination, then it settles upon just one of the three contemplations. And while making that three contemplation, emancipation may arise, or enlightenment may arise. So when enlightenment arises, the enlightenment is called the emancipation, and contemplation is called the door to emancipation, because through the contemplation of non-self, one reaches enlightenment. And when a person, or when his vipassana settles upon the contemplation of impermanence, then his emancipation is said to come through the door of contemplation of the signless. Contemplation of the signless means contemplation of the signs of perversion as permanence, stability and durability which lingers over formations owing to the perversion of perception and the contemplation of suffering which discards desire through craving becomes a door to emancipation termed contemplation of desireless. So the contemplation of suffering is contemplation of desireless and the emancipation can come through this door also. So there are three emancipations and three doors to emancipation. So if with the insight leading to emergence one contemplates on non-self, then the path is known as the void emancipation. So we can call the path void emancipation if the insight leading to emergence contemplates on non-self. So, contemplation on non-self and when emancipation arises, it is called the void emancipation or in Pali, sunyata, sunyata emancipation. If a person contemplates on impermanence anicca, then the path is known as the signless emancipation. And if one contemplates on suffering, then the path is known as the desireless emancipation. So according to the contemplation, the emancipation gets its name. Void emancipation, signless emancipation, and desireless emancipation. Thus the path receives three names according to the way of insight. Likewise the fruit in the cognitive process of the path receives these three names according to the way of the path. If the path gets a name void emancipation, then the fruition moment following it are also uh, get the name void emancipation and so on. So the fruition moments get the name according to the path which precedes them. That is, in this cognitive process or in the process like this. But in the attainment of fruition thought processes, the names are different. So, however, in the cognitive process of the attainment of fruition, that means in Pali, Palasama, but the to those who contemplate in the foregoing manner, the fruits that arise respectively in each case are termed the void emancipation, etc. Only in accordance with the way of insight. So in order to get into the attainment of fruition, enlightened person has to practice vipassana. So there is always vipassana. So after getting enlightenment, after going through the first thought process, that is something like uh, on the screen. And later, 
if he wants to get state again, if he wants to be in that state again, the state of fruition, first he must practice vipassana meditation. But when he practices vipassana meditation, his aim is not to reach the higher stage of enlightenment, but to reach the stage he has already reached. To get into the state again, he has already reached. Since his direction is not for the higher stage of enlightenment, the outcome of his vipassana comes to the arising of the fruition moments which he has already gained. So that is called Palasamapati. Actually, it, it is like a vacation taken by a noble person. So the noble person who has seen the three characteristics of all phenomena cannot take delight in life, cannot take delight in the samsara. But still they have this body and mind and so uh, they are subject to suffering connected with body and mind. But they wanted to get away from the sufferings of body and mind even for a short period of time. So they try to get into the Palasamapati. So when they are in the Palasamapati, that means a thought process like the one on the screen, but not with maga, only with pala moments. And there can be millions of pala moments, because when he prepares to enter into this pala samabhadi, he makes a resolution, say, may I be in that stage for one hour, or may I be in that stage for two, three hours, and so on. So according to his wish, he will be in that stage for one hour, two hours, three hours, one day, two days maybe. During that time, his mind is on Nibbana. And nibbana is the most peaceful state, and so the consciousness that takes Nibbana as object is also peaceful. So he experiences the highest form of peace when he enters into attainment of fruition. So that is why the noble persons try to get into palasama body or attainment of fruition as often as they can. So in that attainment of fruition, the name of the fruition is determined by the vipassana he practices immediately before. So uh, the name of his fruition here is not dependent upon the name of the path he uh, realized maybe some time ago or some days or weeks ago. But it depends on the vipassana he practiced to get into this attainment of fruition. So his original fruition may be, say, white emancipation. But if his a vipassana is mainly on the other type of contemplation, like signless contemplation, then the name of his fruition will not be white emancipation, but signless emancipation and so on. So the name of the fruition moments is different in the initial attainment of enlightenment and later attainment of fruition. Enlightenment thought process arises in a person that means he has gained enlightenment. And there are four stages of enlightenment. So there are four kinds of enlightened persons. Now having developed the path of stream entry, that means having reached the Sotapati Maga Chitta by abandoning wrong views and doubt one becomes a Sotapana. So at the moment of Maga two 
mental defilements are abandoned. One is ditti or wrong view and the other doubt or witty teacher. So these two mental defilements are eradicated at the moment of path, the first path. So at that moment of first path, he is called a person at the path consciousness and after that he is called a person at the Pala moment or he is called a, a person who has entered into the stream. So here stream really means the eight factors. So once a person falls into these eight factors then one will go closer and closer to Nibbana. Just like uh, if one falls into the current of the river then one will be taken closer and closer to the ocean. So he is uh, sure to reach Nibbana once he gets into the stream. And he is the one who has escaped from rebirth in woeful states. So he will not be reborn in hell, he will not be reborn as an animal and so on. And will be reborn at most seven more times in the samsara. That means if he does not reach the higher stages of enlightenment. Suppose a person reaches the first stage of enlightenment here in this life and then he does not reach any more higher stages. In that case he will be reborn in human beings or he will be reborn as celestial beings and so he, he may be reborn in these two uh, realms for seven times and at the seventh rebirth he will surely reach the higher stages of enlightenment and gain what is called parinibbana, the final cessation of suffering. So this is uh, what Isodabana is. Isodabana eradicates wrong view and doubt, two mental defilements and he has escaped from rebirth in woeful state. So he will not be reborn in the woeful state and he will be reborn at most seven more times. But in the commentaries it is also said that he eradicates envy and avarice, jealousy and avarice is difficult to explain. It is intolerance of one's property being common to another. So that is what is called Macharya in Pali and Macharya is translated as Everest. Now, I have this thing. I don't want it to be used by any other person. If any other person makes use of it, I don't like it, I'm angry, something like that. So that is Everest. Mostly people understand avarice as stinginess. But stinginess is not avarice, stinginess is attachment. But here it is dependent on attachment, but it is intolerance of one's property being common to another. So I want to use it for myself only and if anybody comes and makes use of it, I'm angry. So that is avarice. So that kind of thing also the Sota Padi Maga eradicates. That is what the commentaries say. And also in the Abhidhamma text called Pugla Banyati, three kinds of Sota Panas are mentioned. Now you'll find them on page 359. One who will be reborn seven times at most in the human and celestial worlds. And two, one who takes birth in good families two or three times before attaining arahantship. Two or three times actually means two to six times. And one who will be reborn only once more before attaining the goal. So there are three kinds of sotapanas. They differ depending on how strong their uh, vipassana is. And also a sotapanna is marked by scrupulous observance of the five precepts. 
Uh, that is also important thing to note. If a person is a sotabana, he will observe the five precepts perfectly. He will never break any of the five precepts. That is abstinence from taking life, stealing, sexual misconduct, false speech, and use of intoxicants. Now, a sotabana is said to have escaped from rebirth in the woeful states. We say that the doors of the woeful states are closed for him. But that is because a sotabana does not do anything, any unwholesome act that would lead him to rebirth in woeful states. Now that also please note carefully. A sotabana is not reborn in woeful states because he does not do any misdeed that will lead him to rebirth there. If he does any unwholesome act that would lead him to woeful states, then he will be reborn there. Because sometimes people want to deceive other people. And they will say, I am a sotabana. So I can do drinking, uh, <laughs> I can do stealing, <laughs> uh, something like that. And I am immune to this. But that is not the case. You are never immune to this if you do these acts. Because it is a natural law that uh, unwholesome karma will give you unpleasant results. So please note that a sotabana is not reborn in woeful states because he does not do anything that will land him in those woeful states. So a sotabana still has other mental defilements. He still has attachment, loba. He still has dosa. He still has moha. He still has pride and so on. But his mental defilements are not strong enough to lead him to rebirth in woeful states. So his mental defilements are not potent say, to cause him to be reborn in the woeful states. After reaching the first stage, a person will try meditation again to reach the second stage. Suppose a person reaches the second stage. So when he reaches the second stage, the thought process is more or less the same. The only difference is instead of Gotrabu, now there is what is called Vodana or purity. Because there is no change of lineage when a person becomes a Sagadagami or once returner. Because when he has become a Sotabana, he is already a noble person. So when he reaches the second stage, he, he becomes a once returner, he is still a noble person. So there is no change of lineage here. So instead of change of lineage, that moment is called in Pali, Vodana, uh, purification or purity. So that is the only difference. The others are the same. So when one has become a Sagadagami or once returner, with the attenuation of lust, hatred and delusion, he becomes a once returner. That means a once returner does not eradicate any more mental defilements. But he makes the remaining mental defilements weaker. So again, a once returner has loba, he has dosa, he has moha and so on. But his loba, dosa and moha are very, very weak, very subtle. And also these arise in him very infrequently. Because with the attainment of the Sagadagami Maga, he has weakened the mental defilements. He has made the mental defilements weaker. And there are said to be five kinds of one's returner. So you may take them on page 361. One attains the fruit of one's returning in the human world, takes rebirth in the human world, and attains final nibbana here, and so on. So 
Among these five, only the fifth answers the meaning of one's returner. One's returner means he come back to this life once. That means after dying from this life, he will be reborn, say, as a human being or as a deva, and then again he will come back here. So actually, a once returner has two more lives. Not one life, although he's called once returner. That means he come back here once. In order to come back here once, he must go from here to there. So that is one life. And then he comes back to here, that's another life. So there are two more lives for a once returner. So only the fifth one is the exact once, once returner and the others are called once returner because they are similar to the fifth. The description, in this description of once returner there is a word, this world. Who returns to this world? There is difference of opinion among teachers what this world means. Some take it to mean this human world but there are others who take it to mean human world and also the world of celestial beings so according to them it is the Kama Vajra world and not just human world and then there is a third stage of enlightenment and when a person reaches a third stage of enlightenment he is called a non-returner he will not come back here again. So having developed the path of non-returning by totally abandoning sensual lust and ill will. That means eradicating sensual lust and ill will. Sensual lust means uh, lust for sense objects. Lust for objects in the human world and in the celestial world. But there remains lust for Brahma world. So an anagami eradicates sensual lust. That means destroy sensual lust altogether so that anagami has no desire for pleasures in human life or in the life of devas. And ill will or dosa. So anagamis abandon sensual lust and ill will. And he is the one who does not return to this sensuous state. So an anagami will be reborn in the Brahma world only and not in the sensuous state or not in the human world and in the world of devas. So a non ridana has fully eradicated sensual lust and ill will but he still has lust or attachment for Rupa Vajra and Arupa Vajra realms or material realm and the immaterial realm. And it is said that only non-returners are reborn in the pure abodes but there is no fixed determination that all non-returners are reborn there. Normally we say an anagami will be reborn in the pure abodes. But actually they can be reborn in the other realms also. Not in pure abodes only. But in pure abodes there are only anagamis. And no sotabanas, no sakadagamis. What did you say? In the pure abodes, there will also be arahants. Uh-uh. Now, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we are here talking uh, by way of patisandhi, uh, by way of taking rebirth. So, by way of taking rebirth, an arahant has no more rebirth. So, arahant is not reborn there. But after uh, being reborn there, as an anagami, that anagami will become arahant in the uh, pure abodes. So by way of patisandhi or by way of rebirth, only anagamis uh, go to uh, pure abodes. 
So after reaching the viewer abode, they reach the arahantship. Right. <laughs> and also there are five types of anagamis uh, given in, in the Abhidhamma called Pogala Panyati. So they are the five mentioned here. Now we'll go to the arahant. When a person reaches the fourth stage, then he becomes an arahant, the worthy one. A person who is worthy to accept gifts from, say, other people. The gifts given to an arahant brings abundant results. And here, with the total abandonment of defilements, that means all the remaining defilements are eradicated at the moment one reaches arahantship. So all the remaining mental defilements, and they are very sudden and weak ones, so they are all eradicated on reaching the arahanship. And arahan is called a destroyer of the taints, because all taints, all asavas are gone. When he was an anagami, there was still avijja, avijja taint, I mean ignorance taints. But when he becomes an arahant, he eradicates that taint also, and so there is no more taints for him, and so he is called a destroyer of the taints. Actually, here I think taint represents all mental defilements. So he is a destroyer of all mental defilements, and a supreme recipient of offerings. That means he is the one who is most uh, deserving to receive offerings because offerings made to him bring abundant results. And Arahan is uh, said to eradicate five of the <coughs> Sanyojanas or robes. Now you know there are ten Sanyojanas. So there are five that ties one down to lower realms and the others that tie down one to higher realms. So, uh, those that die down to lower realms are eradicated during the lower stages of enlightenment and the five ones that tie down uh, beings to higher existences are eradicated on reaching arahantship. So, when one becomes an arahant, there is no mental defilements whatsoever. So an arahant is not capable of being attached to anything. He is not capable of getting angry, not capable of pride, envy, avarice, and so on. So his mind is totally pure. So once I told a man that Buddha, as an arahant, was say, incapable of getting angry. However, beautiful object he sees, he will not be attached to it and so on. And however great the provocation is, he will not get angry. Then he said, then Buddha was abnormal. (laughs) 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 Sometimes you you get the the most unexpected (laughs) remarks from these people. Now, it's true that Buddha was, but I don't want to say yes. <laughs> so I thought about it and I said, okay, he is super normal <laughs> and not abnormal. <laughs> He's above normal, right? <laughs> so, so Anahan and Buddhas are like that. Uh, they will never get angry. They will never be attached to anything at all. Their minds are totally pure. So we should aim at that total purification of mind. Sometimes I say, don't say that I practice meditation because I want to attain Nibbana, because you don't know what Nibbana is, and you think that you can attain Nibbana only in the next life. What is more practical is the total purification of mind, so we can relate it to ourselves. Now we can think of our mind as totally pure and how good it will be if our minds are totally pure. We are not attached to anything, we are not influenced by anything. 
and so we can stay calm and firm in the face of all ups and downs of life. So that is the ideal stage we should aspire for. And that can be achieved in this very life if we have the paramis or necessary qualifications.